Hello, Exorcist Files fans. If you listen to this show, you know it's fundamentally about freedom. People, through God's power, being set free and liberated from unhealthy relationships, unhealthy habits, and of course, the enemy. We get a lot of questions about Father's recommendations for how Christian men can engage in spiritual formation. We are excited to announce our partnership with Exodus, a spiritual roadmap that helps men experience a deeper Christian life through guided spiritual disciplines passed down from the earliest desert church fathers. Over 100,000 men have gone through an Exodus program, and the testimonies are just incredible. Addictions are broken, marriage is healed, purposes and callings are unleashed. Now, as the holidays approach and we begin to reflect on the year, consider signing up for the season of Advent from Exodus. You and thousands of men will join together to seek God with a guided curriculum and journey. Ask yourself if anything has any undue mastery over you, and if so, help get yourself free. Head on over to startmyexodus.com slash xfiles. Demons keenly study us throughout our lives. They've identified our strengths, they've noted our weaknesses, and they've devised strategies to defeat us. Jeremy, get away from the stove before you burn yourself. I wasn't doing anything. You were certainly wasting gas. I'm sorry. What were you doing over here, making me dinner? I was looking at the fire. What is it with you and fires? Fire doesn't scare me. I know, that's what worries me. Can I be a firefighter when I grow up? (laughs) You can be anything you put your mind to. Now go outside and play. Mama needs to do work. And no campfires. The devil knows us better than we know ourselves. So when the devil makes an offer for some extraordinary ability or for some other kind of gift, there has been careful engineering to make it maximally tempting. It's like a drug to an addict. There's a dependency that's formed. For the victim to give back that gift once he's accepted it can be often unbearable. You're listening to our resident priest and exorcist, Father Carlos Martins. And I'm your co-host, Ryan Bethay. Welcome to The Exorcist Files. Christian theology teaches that all humans are unique, special, and endowed by the Creator with various gifts and abilities. But there are other gifts, gifts that are not from above. What is the source of these gifts? Are they simply the result of being born with superior genetics? Were they dormant in us all along, then awakened by some psychological experience? Or is there another realm competing for influence over humanity and offering these gifts as a lure? May I introduce to you our next case file, the story of Jeremy, a firefighter whose greatest enemy came not in the light of a flame, but in the shadow of darkness. I received a very panicked call one day from a priest who lived a short distance away. It was a Saturday afternoon, and like most priests, he was hearing confessions. Hello, Father. Hello, my son. May God be with you. I... I don't remember my last confession. I understand. Tell me your sins, my son. I confess. I confess. I confess. This is the house of God. You are safe. I confess. Talk to me. I confess to blood. I'm sorry? I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving my vessel. You priest. 
I order you to go in the name of Christ. You can't make me go. Father, I'm not leaving. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, be still, serpent. We've been together too long. He needs me. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, through his tremendous power as God and through his most powerful and salvific name, I rebuke, I repudiate, bind, and cast out all evil spirits. I command all of you in the name of Jesus to depart right now from him and, and, and go immediately directly to the, the foot of the cross of Jesus and, and never return to me. Wait here. We're gonna help you. This is Father Martins. Carlos, it's Stu. Where are you at the moment? Hi, Stu. I'm in my office right now. Oh, praise God. Okay, something urgent has come up. I'm here at St. Joseph's, and just now somebody started manifesting in the confessional. Right now? Yes, right now. I I just stepped away from the booth, but he's currently on the floor, rolling around and growling. His voice is uh, about two octaves lower, and he kept cursing me and saying, He's mine, over and over again. I see. I'm sorry for this, but I think we need to send him to you right now. Okay, slow down. Take a breath. Carlos, he definitely has something going on, and he's enormous. Every time I prayed, it only made things worse. And whatever it is that's manifesting, it's primal. He's acting like an animal. I'm sorry, but I need to send him to you. This thing is escalating quickly. Well, I have my team here, so if it has to happen now, we can do it. I think it does, Carlos. Then bring him over immediately. We'll be ready. All priests have busy schedules. I mean, there is a shortage of priests, so all of us would take on different responsibilities, Normally, a priest does not agree to see an exorcism case immediately because the devil will often send somebody to you to clog your wheels. It is not the case that simply because somebody has a demon that he or she wants to be free of the demon. This is a good moment to remind ourselves that according to Christian theology, human beings are born with free will. In the Bible, one of the most severe cases of demonic possession is the Gerasene demoniac mentioned in Mark chapter 5. In this account, the man, even in the midst of his manifestation, saw Jesus and ran to him to be saved. Tragically though, not all those plagued by evil run towards deliverance. And as Father will stress throughout this series, for an exorcism to really work, there must first exist a desire for liberation. Demons enter by way of doors. A door has to be opened to a demon. That door has to be closed to get rid of him. And if the victim is not willing to do that, there's nothing you as an exorcist can do. That victim has used his or her free will to make a covenant with the devil. It's not in your power to dissolve that covenant. A seasoned exorcist has learned to reject being arbitrarily pulled away from his schedule. But on this particular day, my team and I, we were already meeting. That is why I agreed to meet with this person immediately. When Father alludes to his team, he is referring to other assistants that work with him during exorcisms. For a multitude of reasons, Father typically does not go into the room alone. Whenever possible, there are additional helpers present for support and prayer. When the victim arrived at the door with his wife, his name was Jeremy, and Jeremy was in his late 20s, tall, barrel-chested, chiseled muscles, an absolutely hulking man. And I thought to myself, if this guy gets violent, there will be no stomping. Have a seat. I'm Father Carlos Martin. It's nice to meet you, Father. This is my wife, Rachel. Hey. Hi. Pleased to meet you both. Yeah. I found him to be the epitome of a gentleman. So, let's begin. If it was the case that he had manifested, he certainly was not exhibiting any of that right now. So the issue for any exorcist is he has to diagnose whether a demon is actually present. He can never simply take someone else's word for it. 
In the Catholic Church's ritual for exorcism, which is called the rite of exorcism, it states that for the rite to be administered, the priest has to establish a moral certitude that an individual is possessed before he may administer that rite. Moral certitude is probably best understood in contrast with the kind of certitude offered in mathematics. Any mathematician will reach the same objective result when he's working on an equation as any other mathematician, unless an error has been made. But that kind of certitude is simply not available in real life. And in the case of exorcism, that is no different. The church identifies three signs of possession that an exorcist is told to look for. The first is the ability to speak in and to understand languages that the victim has never learned. For example, if a young Californian girl started speaking in a forgotten Norse language known only to a handful of professors that she had no contact with. The second is knowledge of the occult. Knowledge of events, facts, details, that it would be impossible for the victim to know through natural means. This could be an individual whom you have never met before, looking at you and recounting one of your private experiences to the exact detail, something that no one could know about you. The third sign is the display of superhuman strength, strength beyond one's natural human abilities. Such as an elderly woman weighing 100 pounds, who hurls a 300-pound man across the room. Also, the rite of exorcism identifies that in someone who is possessed, there will always be a vehement aversion to God, to the name of Jesus, to the Blessed Virgin Mary, to the saints, to the church, to the Word of God, and to anything that is sacred. But it's not one of the three classical signs. Aversion to God is not a fourth sign because, while important, it could in practice be faked or there could be some explanation in the natural realm, such as the person may be mentally ill or just strongly dislike religion. A display of superhuman strength can't be faked. The knowledge of unknown and distant events can't be faked. The ability to speak in and to understand languages no one has ever studied, that can't be faked. Father just mentioned the rite of exorcism. And if you're wondering what exactly that is, we asked him to break it down for us. The church has a ritual by which it conducts exorcism. And in the famous movie, The Exorcist, what you see is the exorcist priest. He's praying the prayers from that ritual. Who sent your only begotten son into the world to crush that roaring lion. Hasten to our call for help and snatch from ruination and from the clutches of the noonday devil, this human being made in your image and likeness. But the ritual is itself a relatively new thing. It's only been around for less than 500 years. The ministry of exorcism was there from the beginning. We see it in New Testament times. In the early church, it was largely done by monks and laymen, so the non-ordained. But they were largely people who had set aside their life for ministry. That continued until the Middle Ages when you had a very defined code. In the year 1614, there was a rite of exorcism within a greater ritual called the Roman ritual, which codified all of the different ceremonies and rituals. That in and of itself was a culmination of what happened throughout the early centuries and especially the Middle Ages where the best practices the collective wisdom was acknowledged and put together in instructions that would guide the church in its ministry against the devil. And yes, Father also just mentioned the mother of all films about exorcism, William Friedkin's magnum opus, The Exorcist. Now, when you find yourself in the room with an exorcist, the power of curiosity compels you to ask him his thoughts on the film. I did just that. And I must say that his response was fascinating. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Hello, Exorcist Files fans. If you listen to this show, you know it's fundamentally about freedom. 
people, through God's power, being set free and liberated from unhealthy relationships, unhealthy habits, and of course, the enemy. We get a lot of questions about Father's recommendations for how Christian men can engage in spiritual formation. We are excited to announce our partnership with Exodus, a spiritual roadmap that helps men experience a deeper Christian life through guided spiritual disciplines passed down from the earliest desert church fathers. Over 100,000 men have gone through an Exodus program, and the testimonies are just incredible. Addictions are broken, marriage is healed, purposes and callings are unleashed. Now, as the holidays approach and we begin to reflect on the year, consider signing up for the season of Advent from Exodus. You and thousands of men will join together to seek God with a guided curriculum and journey. Ask yourself if anything has any undue mastery over you, and if so, help get yourself free. Head on over to startmyexodus.com slash xfiles. Welcome back to The Exorcist Files. Let's get back to Jeremy, who, after a violent manifestation in a confessional with another priest, was brought to Father Martin's for immediate help. I led Jeremy and his wife into a room where we could all meet. Why don't we start from the beginning? Jeremy, tell me what happened. Well, I remember going to confession. First time in probably 20 years. I haven't really been involved in the church since I was a kid. And why did you suddenly decide to go to confession? For starters, my wife. (laughs) She knew I needed it. I've been, uh having these episodes, Father. Um, These episodes where I lose track of everything, and when I wake up, it's clear something bad has happened. And what happened? That's the thing, Father. (laughs) Uh, I got to the church, and as I approached the confessional, instant darkness, just like that. Instant darkness. The lights went out, and I was cold. It was just, like, so cold, I was shivering. And that's all I remember. Now I'm here. I see. I wanted to give Jeremy as much freedom as possible to speak, so I excused Jeremy's wife so that only he, my team, and I remained in the room. He described an experience when he was eight years old where his older brother's friends brought home a Ouija board. David said when they played, a book literally flew off the shelf and slammed against the wall. Well, David's a massive liar, so... You don't believe him? He sounded serious, dude. David wouldn't even know what a book was anyway. Kind of here, numb nuts. Whoa, what's that? Did you get a new game? Hands off, Jeremy. This isn't a kid's game. Whatever, Nelson. I'm only three years younger than you, and you're not even an adult yet. Do I hear a dork just begging me for a titty twister? How do you pronounce this thing? A Ouija? Is pronounced, touch it again and I'm deleting Roller Coaster Tycoon. If you did that, I would die. Come on, dude. Just let him play. He'll ruin the game, Joel. No, I won't. The game's more fun with more people. Fine, but I don't want you getting all scared and ruining it for everyone else. I won't. I promise. Now let's Ouija. It's called Ouija, you dingus. So, how does it work? It lets you talk to spirits. We all put our hands on this thing and then we ask a question. If a spirit is listening, it will spell out the answer. For example, say our first question is, why is Jeremy absolutely too shrimpy to be a firefighter? Shut your face, Nelson. Go see you shut up and put your hands on the slider. Let's see if this works. What's up, spirit realm? We're looking for a connection. Are there any spirits that want to talk? We have a question for you. Will little Jeremy here get to be a firefighter when he grows up? upstairs. Come on. I don't want to play this anymore. What's wrong, Jeremy? Two chickens to learn the truth? No, I'm just tired. <laughs> You'll get over it. What are we asking next? How about which one of us gets to go out with Sarah Slaughter? Dude, yes, the answer is me, but let's ask anyone. <laughs> Sleep tight, Jeremy. Good night, Mommy. <clears throat> Later that night, as Jeremy went to bed, a figure came to him that was so black 
that it made the rest of the room appear like it was in broad daylight. Is someone there? Who is there? This figure had the body of a man and had the head of a cat. S stay away! Who, who are you? You've asked, and now you receive. I know what you want to be. How, how do you know that? You asked. I heard. What do you, what do you want? I want... You're scaring me. Please go away. Go away. Never be afraid of anyone. Never again. Give it to me and I shall make you strong. Give you what? Powerful. You must give it to me. What do I have to give you? You know. Cash. What is that? Say yes. Don't you want to be strong? I do. Just say yes. Say it. Okay. Say it. Yes? <laughs> the figure jumped into the air and inside Jeremy through the chest. As Father mentioned in our previous episode with Cheryl and Mark, a mortal sin occurs by breaking any of the Ten Commandments, and violating the First Commandment seems to be the most common gateway for full-blown demonic possession. The First Commandment states, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. And humanity breaks this command time and time again as the gods of our wants and desires are piled up ahead of the Creator. For young Jeremy, it was no different the kingdom of darkness knew his desires, and they stood poised, ready to strike, when a door was inadvertently opened. Remember, demons are pragmatic with what kind of temptations they deliver by leveraging us at strategic weak points. For example, if one develops a proclivity towards telling little white lies, one could be further tempted to lie more gravely. But even if, say, you never lie, good and honorable behaviors can also be weaponized. Imagine a pious, quiet, devoted monk who fasts regularly out of devotion to God. The monk, in theory, could then be tempted to judge others who do not also fast, thus inserting pride into his life and rendering the behavior sinful. But fear not, my fellow mortals. Father is not suggesting that demons are behind every temptation and bad decision. And if the Christian narrative is true, it would be good to remember what we learned in episode one there remain twice as many good angels in support of humanity. With that favorable ratio in mind, let's get back to Jeremy, who was just infiltrated by an alien presence. And from that moment, Jeremy recalled being the strongest kid around. His teachers were amazed at how powerful he was. But along with this, Jeremy also experienced an increased aggression. No, no, no. Don't be breaking in my no, house. No, Sal! You grabbed my arm. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Next time, don't be grabbing my arm. Don't be a bitch. What was that? You heard me? Now who's pointing again? Just let it go, Jeremy. Uh-oh. Jeremy's mad, you guys. You better be careful. My dad's in the name. Oh, oh my. <sighs> Wait. My tooth. Oh. Jeremy's <sighs> You're hurting him! You're hurting him! Jeremy! Food in my fire! He would become easily upset at anything, and he began having terrible bouts of rage directed at anything and anyone. Another common external sign of possession is bouts of uncontrollable rage and violence, 
whereby the possessed loses control of their normal personality and enters into a frenzy of anger, verbally or physically attacking others. In the more acute episodes of rage, the possessed will often lose consciousness, and after regaining consciousness, they remember nothing. Other victims have noted being conscious during the episode, but, quote, feeling as if an alien presence is operating in their bodies, end quote. Conscious or not, a second personality does emerge from within the victim, one of evil character. Outside of these bouts of fury, however, the victim can live an otherwise normal life. Jeremy frequently got into fights against even much older and bigger kids, but he never lost a fight. And eventually nobody was willing to fight him. He began to experience blackout periods where he would lose consciousness and memory. Suddenly and without warning, he would find himself in a completely different place than where he just was, having no idea how he got there. And there would always be a lapse of time. I went to South Point Mall, and then the next thing I know, I'm walking down the street 10 miles away. No idea how I got there. And I pulled $258 worth of cash out of my pocket. I have no idea whose money it is, how it got in my pocket. It's like, like someone just hit fast forward on the tape, you know? Just skipped ahead. Jeremy had one goal in life, and it was to be a firefighter. He enrolled in the firefighting academy after completing high school. Although he had to work hard at academics, he breezed through the physical requirements, and upon graduating, he was hired immediately. So it was around this time that Jeremy began dating a young woman named Rachel. Rachel was attracted to his physique. Jeremy was elated that he finally found somebody willing to put up with his temper. Eventually, their relationship got serious, and they married. By this time, Jeremy's blackout periods had grown to encompass days. On one occasion, he woke up in a completely different town. Shirtless, shoeless, his knuckles were scraped, and his body was bruised and covered with cuts and scratches. Where the hell am I? Well, I'm done. Oh, no, not again. It's okay, Jeremy. I'm done. Get out of my head. Shoot. I don't want this anymore. I'm done with this. I want you gone. Get my... Head, get out! Get out! My body. My body. And I want you out. It's my body. I want you out. It's my body. It's my body. It's my body. Jeremy, stop it! Stop, babe. Please, please come back. Jeremy. What's happening? You did it again. No, no, babe. I'm sorry. Come on, come on. All right, yeah. Oh, babe, I'm sorry. Okay, come on. Hey, you're okay. You're okay. No, no, no. That's all right, honey. Let's sit. You okay? Sorry. Okay, okay. Okay. Jeremy? Jeremy, this has to end. You need help. What? What happened? You'll have to get groceries. Do you remember? Um, how many hours have I been gone? Jeremy, you left two days ago. I called your work. No one knew where you were. Rach, I... Where the hell were you? I, I don't know what's happening. Okay, okay. I don't, I don't know what's, what's going on. It's okay, it's okay. Each time he went missing, which was at least once every two months, Rachel called the fire department and reported that he was ill. 
And somehow, in all of this, he managed to keep from getting fired. Rachel began to fear for her safety. While the blackouts had always frightened Jeremy, now that he was losing whole days and not just hours, and now that he was finding trauma on his body, he was terrified. He knew there was something inside him, something that was evil, and he simply didn't know what to do about it. Around this same time, Jeremy's parents rediscovered their Christian faith. While they had never been bad people, they now had become extraordinarily good people. And this had a great effect on Rachel. She became attracted to the people that they had become. So it was eventually Rachel who broached the God question with Jeremy. You gotta finish that? No, no, you go for it. Thanks. Gotta be hungry. Starving. Jeremy, I think it's time we fix this. I know. I'm sorry, I know. And I think whatever this is, it's more than just psychological. I think we need to go to church. I think you're right. Really? Yeah. I know this sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, there's something inside me. I can't describe it, but it's living in there like a self-governing thing that's not me. It has objectives apart from my own, and it completes them without my knowledge. With my body, it can happen at any time. I don't know what I've done. But babe, I've seen blood on my hands after these blackout spells. I know I've done some terrible things, but it's not me. You have to believe me, it's not I, me. I trust you, babe, I'm just, I'm scared. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. You're my life. Okay, when we were married, I made a vow to protect you, but this thing, this thing is pure fucking evil. It operates outside my consciousness, and I'm petrified okay, of what it might do next. What do you think it is? Something that's been inside me for a long time. I've always brushed it off as a bad dream, but it's real. And it sure as hell isn't good. I need a priest. <laughs> I'm going to confession tomorrow. I love you so much. I love you too, Rachel. And thank you for believing me. We'll be right back after this short commercial break. Hello, Exorcist Files fans. If you listen to this show, you know it's fundamentally about freedom. People, through God's power, being set free and liberated from unhealthy relationships, unhealthy habits, and of course, the enemy. We get a lot of questions about Father's recommendations for how Christian men can engage in spiritual formation. We are excited to announce our partnership with Exodus, a spiritual roadmap that helps men experience a deeper Christian life through guided spiritual disciplines passed down from the earliest desert church fathers. Over 100,000 men have gone through an Exodus program, and the testimonies are just incredible. Addictions are broken, marriage is healed, purposes and callings are unleashed. Now, as the holidays approach and we begin to reflect on the year, consider signing up for the season of Advent from Exodus. You and thousands of men will join together to seek God with a guided curriculum and journey. Ask yourself if anything has any undue mastery over you, and if so, help get yourself free. Head on over to startmyexodus.com slash xfiles. Welcome back to The Exorcist Files. As I mentioned earlier, I did take the opportunity to ask an exorcist what he thought of the 1973 film, The Exorcist. Well, actually, our producer Chandler posed the question. He's our resident film geek. The Exorcist was a, a very popular movie, and it put exorcism on the map, so to speak. 
much better than the movie was the book. And much better than the book is the actual case, the notes for the original case. The case is known as the St. Louis Exorcism of 1949. The demoniac was identified under the pseudonym Roland Doe. In the movie, it became a girl, but actually was a boy who's, he'd be an old man now, but I believe he's still alive. His family was Lutheran. He was 13 years old and became possessed through a Ouija board encounter. His aunt was a spiritualist, liked to communicate with the dead, used a Ouija board to do so. She invited him to, hey, you know, sit at the table with me and, you know, I'll show you something neat. And he became possessed out of one single encounter. There was an actual transcript by an eyewitness present in the room, one of the Jesuits that was in that room. His job was to take notes. The transcript of that case was well done. I have a copy of that among my files at home. Yes, it's in his vault. The Exorcist is impressive on many counts. The interaction between the priest and the demon is largely accurate. In an exorcism, you will see violent, belligerent behavior. You'll see the laws of nature suspended. You'll see vomit do things that vomit doesn't typically do, a kind of marksmanship with spit and vomit that is incredible. You will see temperature changes in the room. You'll see levitation, or at least you can see these things. If you have yet to see the film, forewarning, there are spoilers ahead. Then again, it's been 50 years. You should have seen this by now. I have to say that the ending was not based on the actual account and was frankly to me as an exorcist scandalous, where the priest, in order to quote unquote, save the victim, commands the demon to leave the victim and enter into him. Take me. Come into me. Damn you. Take me. you would absolutely never do that because you are then cooperating with the devil. The battle in exorcism is not between the priest and the devil. The battle is between Christ and the devil. Christ is the warrior, you are his agent. You are never disappointed when the devil doesn't come out on your command because it's not your command at the end of the day, it's Christ. So for you to come in as an exorcist and say to the demon, I want you out of that victim and I want you in me. Well, now you've made this exorcism about you. You've made things exponentially worse because now the devil has a greater prize than he had in the victim, you. And even if the devil is exorcised out of you, your life will never be the same. It will never be the same. The fate of Father Karras, the film's fictional priest who commands the demon to take him instead of the girl, then jumps out of the window, was actually modeled after a real-life priest from an intensely controversial series of cases in France known as the Loudon Possessions. Containing sensational reports of possessed nuns, lurid sexual tales, political machinations, shocking torture, and exhibitionism, these accounts could easily be made into a 10-hour television miniseries but important to mention right now is the priest who was called to exercise the Mother Superior of the Loudon Convent, Father Jean-Joseph Seron. He was a devoted Jesuit priest and exorcist who rose to the occasion. It was there he directly challenged the demon to attack him instead, and the demon complied. Claiming he himself was possessed after the events, Seron eventually became unable to eat, dress himself, walk, read, or write. He no longer prayed to God and continually saw visions of devils and other terrors. According to a letter he sent to fellow Jesuit, Father de Tichy, dated May 3, 1635, Saran wrote, quote, I have very little freedom of action. When I desire to talk, I am forced to remain silent. I cannot take part in the communion. At the table, I cannot lift a bite to my mouth. During confession, I forget suddenly all of my sins and I feel the devil hovering over me as if he is at home. When I wake up, he is already here. At the morning prayer, he cast away the thought from my head as he wishes. When my heart starts to open up, he fills it with anger. He puts me to sleep when I desire to remain awake, and in public, speaking through the mouth of that possessed woman, 
he brags that he is my master, and I cannot argue against." End quote. In 1645, overcome with suicidal despair over his eternal damnation, Saran threw himself out the window of a Jesuit home near Bordeaux. The house was built above a river, and he landed on the rocks below. Unlike fictional Father Karras, however, Saran survived the fall with a broken thigh bone. While skeptics who analyzed his post ladone behavior leaned to the pathological, many admitted it is at least curious that Saran's sudden transformation from seemingly normal mental health to a state of mental torment began immediately after he provoked a demon to enter him. And regrettably, Father Martins revealed to us that this ill-advised exorcism tactic was not an isolated event. I know of a situation where it happened two years ago. A priest who is possessed. And he had no training, and he had no business doing an exorcism to begin with, ordained two years ago, was thrown in in that ministry. His bishop allowed him to function with that, and now he makes our job way more difficult. And this is why the church takes great pains to only allow a certain kind of person in that battle. Because you've now become the victim. And the devil now has the Easter egg that he always wanted. I feel compelled to mention that out of all our recording sessions with Father Martins, this was the only time he became noticeably agitated. But hey, even Jesus got angry once. That's all the time we have for this episode. But join us next week for the conclusion of Jeremy's saga. Yes, the exorcism is coming. And forewarning, the material may be too intense for some. Listener discretion is advised. Here's a sneak peek of our next episode. Jeremy, can you hear me? Talk to me. Jeremy, are you able to? This piece of flesh is mine. I command 20 legions, you deplorable pygmy priests. I have authority. <laughs> and remember, folks, do not, under any circumstance, Tell, invite, or even hint for a demon to enter into you. To understate Father Martins, that would be bad. Thank you so much for joining us, and see you next week on The Exorcist Files. All cases in The Exorcist Files are recounted by Father Carlos Martins from his personal archives. The Exorcist Files is hosted by Father Martins and myself, Ryan Bethay. This episode's reenactments were directed and recorded by Chandler Mays and Ryan Bethay in Los Angeles, California, and Atlanta, Georgia. Jeremy's mom is portrayed by Christina Sidney, young Jeremy by Alex Sidney, priest who is out of his element by Joe Coffey, adult Jeremy by Nicoa DeCoit, Father Martins by Paul Leach, Rachel by Melissa Luna, Jeremy's brother Nelson by Donovan Elmore, Nelson's friend Joel by Finn Alexander, disembodied demon voice by Ryan Bethay, Basketball Boy Jim by Max McQuarrie, and Basketball Boy Brad by Tony Arpiccio. Script written by Chandler Mays and Ryan Bethay. Original theme and select scores written and composed by Dan Carey Bailey. Additional music graciously provided by Zguba. And you can find his music at zguba.bandcamp.com. Assistant editor is JJ Posway. Supervising producer, sound engineer, editor, and mixer is Chandler Mays. Executive producer is Jonathan Dressler. Special thanks to HPN for generous use of their office space and the subsequent disarray. To Monsignor Robert Sarno and Mr. Alan Holdren for helping make this show possible. Any likeness or similarities of characters are entirely coincidental and unintentional on the part of the writers. And finally, Chandler would like to thank the Burbank Airport as well as all the leaf blowers out there for teaching him an enduring lesson in patience. The Exorcist Files is a production of iHeartRadio. Stay demon-free, y'all.